Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. My name is Stan the Annuity Man, America's Annuity Agent. Yes, I am licensed in all 50 states. I'm so glad you joined me today on all major podcast platforms. And also we have a Fun with Annuities YouTube channel if you wanna see me and the guests interact and see our facial expressions when one of us says something that's funny or crazy or something like that. But I'm gonna tell you something. Today is a special day for me. Um, this is almost, I'm almost a fanboy at this point in time. And what that means is I really look up to my guest. He is a, he is a person that I follow. I read pretty much everything that he writes. Um, if there was ever an icon in the financial business and the annuity business, it's our, it's our guest today. His name is Moshe Malewski, and let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a tenured professor of business finance. He's a published author and a well-known consultant. He's based in Toronto, Canada. He has an MA, and he got that in 1992, in mathematical statistics. He has a PhD, got that in 1996, in financial economics. Um, he is a 2002 fellow of the Fields Institute for Research and Mathematical Science, Sciences. Now, now we get to the, the fun part, and this is where I start following him because that other stuff's way above my head. He's published 16 books translated into six languages and has authored over 70 peer-reviewed scholarly artic articles. I need you to hang in there with me. Put your seatbelt on. This is important. One of his books called King William's Tontine, which we're going to talk about, is about why the retirement annuity of the future should resemble its past. And it's very, very interesting. As a new book coming out uh, this month, and at the time of this taping is June of 2022, and it's called How to Build a Modern Tontine Scripts, Tips, and Algorithms. He is also a FinTech entrepreneur. Yes, he is very busy. With a number of US patents and, and computational innovations in 2014, he sold his startup company to a company that we use called Canex that provides the fees to our calculators. Um, he was named by Investment Advisor Magazine as one of the 35 most influential people in the US financial advisory business over the last 35 years. He's delivered over 1,500 presentations and keynote lectures around the world, including academic seminars at Stanford, Columbia, and MIT, et cetera, et cetera. His current research is fascinating because he's, his interest revolves around the history of how aging consumers financed and paid for the last few decades of their life, but he's researching that on how that happened over the last few centuries. It is my absolute honor to have Moshe Malevsky on Fun with Annuities. Thank you so much for being here. And you're very kind with your introduction and your praise, and uh, as you know, uh, you're quite the legend yourself, so uh, I appreciate being here, and uh, hopefully I can ask you just a couple of questions when you're asking me questions so that we get a bit of a dialogue going. Absolutely. Obviously, I went through your background and, and, and your education, which is unmatched. Um, how did you land in the annuity space? I mean, I mean, you have a, you know, an, a master's in mathematical sciences, a PhD in financial economics. How do you get to annuities? How did that happen? Uh, so, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, annuities are sort of a small part of what I do. My day sure. job is teaching undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, my 22-year-old undergraduates don't really care very much for annuities, sadly. They're 22 years old. They have student right. loan debt. They're trying to figure out what to do with their lives. You know, if you talk about student loans, they'll be interested. If you talk about mortgages, housing, you know, right. health insurance. So it was a, there's this enormous group of financial products out there that consumers right. have to be aware of. And as you get older and as you get closer to retirement, obviously annuities are a very, very important component. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I often uh, tell people that uh, when we have a uh, session for parents who want to send their students or their kids to 
uh, university, they come to our you know, gymnasium and they walk around and they see the different areas that are available and students come with their parents. You know, these are high school kids and they stop at my desk uh, where I'm selling the right. uh, you know, business course and the students say, so what do you teach? And I say, well, I teach retirement income planning and then they move right along you know, 10 <laughs> seconds later. The parents stay, the parents stay. The parents stay. So, you know, clearly this is something that is age specific. So let me respond to your question, how I got into annuities. Sure. Uh, I got into annuities because uh, I came face to face with longevity risk at a very young age. Longevity risk, as you know, is this uncertainty about how long you're going to live. So my dad passed away at a very young age. He developed colon cancer and okay. passed away in his uh, late 40s. So, you know, that's one side of longevity risk. Uh, my grandfather, on the other hand, just passed away recently. He lived to his late 90s. So look at that divergence there. Mm -hmm. So to me, what interested, we sort of, I looked at that and said, okay, so, you know, there's got to be some way to manage your financial affairs with that sort of uncertainty. How do you manage your financial affairs when, you know, it may last as, long, as short as 45 years, it can go as long as 95 years. So that sort of led me to the insurance as a solution and insurance as risk management. Uh, that, that's sort of the short response to how I got into it. Uh, and, you know, I'd be delighted to dig a little bit deeper. But, uh, you know, coming face to face with longevity risk is something that alerted me to the fact that there's a need for uh, uh, the annuity solution. I also worked as an intern for a while at a very large uh, insurance company in New York called Tia Kreff, you know, sure. back in the 1980s. And sure. of course, they're very, very big in the, in, in the in, in, in annuity space, obviously, for qualified 401k, 403b plans, 401a plans. So I learned a little bit about the industry there as an actuarial trainee many, many mm -hmm. years ago when I was trying to figure out what I want to do with myself. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of paths that lead to it. And recently, it's been an interest in history. And the fact that, as I'm sure you know, annuities predate stocks and bonds. So, you know, you think mutual funds have been around forever. Uh, no, actually, annuities have been. And, and that's the way people finance their retirement. Then my question to you being just actually the thought leader in our space is how has the annuity industry done such a poor job in your opinion on messaging the fact that we have the monopoly that everybody wants the product, which is lifetime income. How have we, how have we messed that up as an industry? Cause that just confounds me every single day, especially when people say, well, I hate all annuities. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. That's like saying you hate all restaurants. Um, it yeah. makes no sense. Yeah. What has happened? So, how is the how have we gotten here to where annuity is actually a curse word in a lot of the consumer circles and also un, uneducated financial circles? Right. So, you know, Stan, with every question that you ask me, you have to tell me whether you want the 10 second response, the 10 minute response or the 10 hour lecture series response. So I, you know, <laughs> I want the I, consumer sure where... response. So dig yeah. in as long as you want to dig in. Look, so let, let, let me try to put this in bite sized pieces. I think there's a lot of confusion over what an annuity really is. The word annuity today is as meaningless as fund. You called it restaurants. I say funds. You know, when a reporter calls me up and says, what do you think about annuities? I say, what do you think about funds? <laughs> You know, private equity funds, venture capital funds, mutual funds, bond funds, stock. It's a meaningless word. Nice. You can attach it to almost anything. Nice. And uh, legally, what an annuity is, is very different to what an economist would call an annuity. It's certainly different from what, uh, you know, a media writer would call an annuity. It's just there's this vagueness. What is it? Uh, and if you go back a few hundred years, the annuity meant something very, very specific, very well known, very defined. And then for some reason, you know, 300 years later, it means almost anything to anyone. So number one is confusion about what this thing means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, is number number two. I think that uh, there was a period in the late '80s, possibly early '90s, where the commissions, the fees that people were paying uh, for these, uh, either as uh, you know commissions that were explicit, where you know really only 80% of your money goes to work, or commissions that were hidden and paid because you couldn't surrender for 20 years, uh, were very very high, atrociously high, unconscionably high, and they gave these instruments a very bad name. Now, those were very specific types of annuities, and mm -hmm. they you know, certainly weren't all annuities, so that, that was part of it. Uh, I think that another problem with annuities, and you know, this will be my last point before I you know, sort of turn it back to you, is annuities are, sold, annuities are sold to a group of people that are vulnerable. You know, they're sold to older people. You know, we're not selling it to 23-year-olds. We're right. selling it to people that are older. And in some sense, you know, the, the point of this product is to generate some sort of predictable income when you're no longer able to make decisions yourself, a cognitive decline. 
So when you have a product that really is meant to help people that are eventually going to cognitively decline and help them deal with the finances, you know, there's a higher burden of care there because you got to make sure that they understand what they're buying. They continue to understand what they're buying. Sure. And in many cases, annuities are quite complicated. So you have something very complicated going to someone whose ability to make those decisions decline over time. And that's a recipe for disaster. So in, in some sense, there's a whole bunch of reasons, but I do agree with your premise. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of fear. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of backlash against it. Hopefully that helps put this in context. And it does. And I've, and I've said to industry leaders and, and, and CEOs of carriers to say, just, just, let's just get it down to a couple of words. I'm, you know, I'm a marketer. I understand how to brand things, obviously. And I think it really comes down to, um, I, I, I go back to the Got Milk ad where it just said Got Milk. I think we should have one that says Got Guarantees or Got Lifetime Income. Yeah. I really believe we can frame the value proposition of what we're doing and what we're offering, which, you know, with 10,000 baby boomers hitting the age 65, they're not looking for the next Tesla or the next Microsoft or the next growth stock. They're looking for guarantees and they're looking for lifestyles, which leads me to my next question. And I had this vision of you, Moshe, in the, in the bowels of some library in Europe reading about tontines and doing your research on where annuities first started. But the reason I bring that up is I want you to correlate that to, to the products that are out there now and your hope to where things are going to go. And maybe you can just give a brief um, history of, of tontines because when you Google it, it's amazing what comes up. One of the questions that people have is, are are tontines illegal? That's one of the main questions that pop up. So give us the, the dumbed down version of what that is and why you're attracted to that. Yeah, so, you know, as usual, Stan, your questions could, could take me, you know, five hours to answer. So I, I, I'm gonna selectively pick certain pieces of it. Sure. Because for many of your viewers, this may be the first time in their life they've heard the word tontine. They don't know how to spell it yet. And, and maybe they're Googling it right now. So you know, there's a lot going on. So let, let me explain a little bit of historical background and hopefully this partially answers the many questions you've just asked. What, what interests me, why I'm fascinated with history is because the narrative right now in the financial industry is that pensions are going away. Pensions are going away. Defined mm -hmm. benefit pensions are no longer the norm for employees. Mm -hmm. uh, Social Security, the trust fund in the U.S., is you know on its way down. So there's questions about sustainability, and uh, employers don't really care about their employees once they retire. So you're on your own, buddy. Ergo, we must all move into the annuity space. What interests me is what in the world did people do prior to defined benefit pensions? Not what are they going to do in the demise and decline of defined benefit. What did they do before? And, uh, you know, if you take a look at when defined benefit pensions started, you know, we're talking about the beginning of the 20th century. Social Security, FDR, the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're really familiar with pension history, then you will know the name Bismarck, you know, the German chancellor. He starts pensions in 1880. And, and everybody's entitled when they get old to get a pension. What did old people do before these state programs? Now, the, the ignorant response is that there were no old people prior to 1880 and that Bismarck <laughs> somehow discovered that there's old people and we need to give them pensions. That is simply not true. Life expectancy at birth might have been very low. There were many old people. In fact, if you go back to the archives, there are people that made it into their 80s and 90s. And I could spend an entire hour going through all the famous philosophers and statesmen and, and you know, U.S. presidents from the revolution onward that lived far beyond life expectancy. What did they do? How did they get to retirement, stop being able to work, and how did they get an income? And uh, the next response tends to be, well, their fi family supported them. They lived at home and they didn't eat it. That's also not true because of the fact that not all of them had families and, and many of the families had moved away. So once you sort of eliminate all the nonsense, you're left with, how did they finance their retirement? And the answer is they went out and they bought annuities. They went to the state, they went to the government, they went to early insurance companies, they went to their local church, they went to their parish, and they entered into a scheme where they would be receiving an income for the rest of their life, guaranteed, a word that you like, as long as they live in exchange for a lump sum right now. Uh, in fact, the earliest nursing homes were uh, monasteries where people would go in, they were called karodis, where you go into the monastery and say, look, I got a bunch of money, this is my nest egg, you take it, take care of me for the rest of my life. 
and they would, in a sense, issue an annuity. And the annuity would be paid not just in, in, in living somewhere, uh, they'd be paid in beer and bread and wine and, you know, a, a shirt once a year. And, and that would be your annuity. It would be paid in goods and services. Part of the products that people bought hundreds of years ago to maintain themselves in the retirement was a name, a word that you just mentioned called a tontine. Mm -hmm. A tontine was one of the many schemes that people used to finance themselves in retirement. It was a scheme in which the longest living people got the most amount of income. The people that didn't live a long time got a smaller amount of income. It was a type of an annuity. And I think that, you know, with that background, we, we understand that there are many different ways to finance retirement in the Middle Ages, and, and that was one of them. And I find the Tontine an interesting scheme, and I think that there's more discussion about bringing it back. That's sort of the three-minute summary. No, I, I got you. One of the words that popped out when you use is the word scheme. And in the United States, scheme is a bad word. Scheme means we're taking advantage of you. Scheme means you're... Um, you know, there's something we're not telling you. And I think that that word attached to annuity, um, even though you know, and I know that's not the intended use, people go, yeah, see, it's a scheme. It's not a scheme. What he's saying is this was the strategy that people were using at that point in time. Um, but even when you Google Tontine, it says a scheme used, you know, hundreds of years ago, et cetera. Um, that's an interesting word, but don't you agree that that word has some connotation that's negative that people that aren't up to speed on the history, they say, well, you know, scheme means schemes bad, right? Yeah. So I'm a mathematical economist, so I can use the word scheme because you know, I agree. I, I, I don't I agree answer with that. to that. I don't answer to that crowd. Uh, I'm not a politician running for office trying to figure out, you know, let's test 10 different words and see which one the public likes. And I'm describing it the way, you know, that is described historically. You go back to the documents, that was the one. But I, I certainly agree with you is that if I'm a marketing department in a modern <laughs> insurance company, you're right. I, I will stress test every word I use with focus groups. And, you know, I'm not even sure I'd use the word tontine. And Stan, since you brought this up, many of the tontines that are emerging around the world, and they are emerging, there are many examples of it. If I were to take a look at the common denominator of all of them, uh, there is certainly a very successful one that was just launched in Australia. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one in South Africa I was involved with. There's some in Canada. All of them, all of them, the common theme is they don't use the word tontine, and they certainly don't use the word scheme. They use the thinking behind it. They mm -hmm. use the pooling and the risk sharing, uh, but they don't use the word because they feel that like you, you know, people Google it and then they hear that, you know, Homer Simpson in an episode of the Simpsons lost money on a tontine. So, hey, if Homer <laughs> Simpson law, I don't want Marge yelling at me if I, I you know, or, 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 or they hear that it's illegal because the state of New York in 1906 banned tontine insurance. So I agree with you that words matter and we don't want to use scheme and maybe not even use tontine, but the thinking behind it, mm -hmm. namely that people that live a long time are subsidized by people who don't. And as you live longer, your income goes up. Uh, that, that's something that, uh, that makes sense. And you know, to get to a point that you made earlier, we all like the word guaranteed. It's an, it's an important mm -hmm. word. Uh, you know, that's a word we use. Scheme we don't use, guarantee we use. Sure. But the problem is, is that what's guaranteed in today's lexicon, what's guaranteed is a nominal cash flow. Nominal. Nominal means I have no idea what this is going to buy me in real terms. Nominal usually means it's not adjusted for inflation. Nominal means we have no idea what goods and services I'm going to be able to buy with it. I mean, honestly, if I guarantee you $1,000 a week for the rest of your life, do you really know 20 years from now what you'll be able to do with $1,000? I mean, we really don't. So we use the word guaranteed, but in some sense, it's a guarantee of a something, but anything that I want to buy with that is not guaranteed. So one of the reasons that the Tontine concept, whatever you call it, is gaining credence is the idea is, hey, the longer I live, I want those payments to go up. I'm not interested in guarantees, but I want something that keeps up with the cost of living, roughly speaking. And I think that's one of the appeals. But to sort of wrap this up and to answer your question, I think there are lessons to be learned from how people finance themselves in their older age, hundreds of years ago, there are lessons to be learned for today. I may not design an iPad or an iPhone the way it was designed 300 years ago, they didn't exist. But when it comes to financing retirement, there's something about the way we did it in the past that might resonate with the future. 
And hold that thought for a second. We're talking to Moshe Malevsky, just an icon in our business. Now, he's written some fantastic books, and we're going to have those links on our site. He's going to have his own page like, like all of our celebrity guests do. But some of the books that I would tell you to, to look at is one of them that I love, The Seven Most Important Equations for Your Retirement, was fantastic. Obviously, I've talked about King William's Tontine, which is one of his books, recent books, which I've read a couple of times. He also has one called Pensionize Your Nest Egg, which I think is very good. And then one that I really like called Longevity Insurance for a Biological Age. So he, he brings it down to your level. He can do that, but you can tell by just him talking that he's at another level. I think if there's ever an annuity odd couple that gets along and, and is on the same page, it's us. <laughs> you know, Because for me, I consider myself the annuity whisperer that's, that's trying to dumb it down to a level that I always tell people, if you can't explain it to a nine-year-old, don't buy it. No offense to nine-year-olds. Um, and I think the great part about Moshe is he, he can change gears and bring it down to a consumer level. And those books that I just mentioned are, are some of the ones that I'm going to point you to and have links to where you can go get them on Amazon. Let's go back to the Tontines, Moshe. I, um, I'm fascinated with this, and I'm always thinking, okay, where's the puck going to be? I'm giving some hockey analogies since you're a Canadian. Um, instead of skating after it, where's it going to be? Do you ever see Tontines entering this country in a fashion that it's the consumers can get it, understand it, and then eagerly buy it? So, you know, it, it depends on who the audience is that's listening to my response i'm you know if if this is consumers it is i don't really if i don't really see the word tontine catching on okay. uh and and becoming an alternative to an annuity because of some of the historical issues there um but i do think that uh, here here's the the business challenge asset managers large asset managers are realizing that their inability to offer guarantees might hinder their asset gathering and certainly assets under management uh, model. Mm -hmm. So people are moving into retirement and they're saying, all right, these mutual funds, these ETFs were great to help me accumulate wealth, but now I need a stable, predictable, I like that better than guaranteed, stable and predictable income for the rest of my life. And I just can't get that from this very volatile ETF or mutual fund. And the asset managers are gonna see some of that money, perhaps a lot of that money leak and leave towards the type of solutions that you've been discussing, whether it's mm -hmm. the annuities or the MIGAs or the QLACs mm -hmm. or the DS and so on. So th there are two ways that uh, from a business point of view, asset managers can deal with that. They can say, well, we're gonna partner with insurance companies and we're gonna somehow try to share revenue or we're gonna try to you know, keep some of the assets and, and, and partner with insurance companies because people like the predictability and stability. Or they might say, you know what, maybe we can enter into this business without offering those guarantees. And the only way to do that would be taunting like structures. So the short answer to your question is, I think that within five years, you're going to see asset managers offering things that you and I would call a tontine, whether or not they use that word as separate. Fascinating. I think when, people, when you were initially describing tontines, I think people stopped the car and jumped off the treadmill when you said the word increasing income, because that's the biggest question I get in this inflationary world that we're living in is you know, how, do we, how, do, how do we adjust for inflation? How do we address inflation? And as you well know, Moshe, and I'm just telling this for the consumers that are listening to this, when you attach an increase to a current commercial annuity, it's called a cost of living adjustment. In the past, there was CPIU, Consumer Price Index increases. But annuity companies have the big buildings for a reason, as I always say, they don't give that away. They just simply lower the initial payment to make up for that. But when you start talking about tontines adjusting and increasing. Can you go into that for the consumer on what that might look like from a 30,000 foot view? Yeah, so you understand that when I sit here and we're having a conversation, I have four hands tied behind my back. I don't I have a blackboard, I don't have my slides, I don't have the, the graphics, I certainly can't do equations, you'd probably shut me down. So <laughs> there's, a li there's a limit as to how much this can be explained to the point where the consumer says, ah, I get it. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry, you, you, we need to explain things, you know, using certain things. 
But the idea here is, is that if you enter into a, 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 an arrangement where people that live a long time get to share uh, the benefits from something, since there are less people living a long time, they're going to share more benefits. So let, let, let me try to put this without any algebra. Im imagine that you and me and a group of our neighbors decided to buy a 30-year treasury bond from the U.S. Treasury. And it was a unique type of bond that we all bought together, us, all our buddies, we bought it. It's a bond that pays coupons for 30 years, but it never pays back the principal at the end. It never pays back the principal at the end. And you're saying, Moshe, why would I buy something that never pays back my principal at the end? And the answer is because instead they'll give you higher coupons. So, you know, right now the 30 year rate would be 3%, but you're getting your principal back at the end. They'll give you seven or 6% and then you don't get the principal back at the end, which is kind of an evening out of your coupons. We all, all of us in the neighborhood to decide to buy one of these bonds that are paying, you know, let's say 6% a year, right? And here's what we do. We've bought this bond and we enter into an agreement, you and me and many others. And we look, whoever is alive gets to share those coupons. We, at the end of every year, are going to go to the local golf club or the local bar, and we're going to all toast whoever's alive, and we get to split those coupons. But if you're not around, you can't split the coupons. So let's imagine what happens when all of us have bought this bond, and after one year, we're all healthy, we're good, we all get 6%. We're getting the $6,000 a year on our $100,000. And then in a year from now, we come back to celebrate, are we alive? And yeah, we're all alive, so we're getting 6000 but then at the end of the third year, God forbid one of us has a heart attack or one of us has a stroke or one of us is in a car accident. We're not there to toast our longevity. And suddenly there are less of us, there's less of us, but we still have that $6,000 coupon. We're sharing it over a smaller group. At the end of the year, we have that 6,000 coupon that's being paid, but it's being split with a smaller group. How does this work? We have the same amount of cash in the numerator, to use a mathematical term, but the denominator is shrinking. There are less of us. And then 10 years later, you know, say half of us are still there. Other half have not made. Well, the numerator is still exactly the same. The denominator is shrinking. Each one of us is getting a bigger and bigger payment. Whoever's around 30 years from now, whoever's around 30 years from now, they're still giving out the 6,000, but we're splitting it over a very, very small group. We're getting a really big coupon which is a naturally increasing hedge in some sense against inflation, even though none of us bought an inflation-linked bond. Mortality becomes a real interest rate. Mortality, mortality rate. Without having to worry about buying inflation-linked bonds and tips and I bonds and, and reserves. So that is incredibly uninteresting when inflation's at 2% or less and nobody knows what inflation is. But suddenly, in the last year or two, inflation is a very hot topic on Google. You Google it and you get, you know, the engram. That's a, that's a word that's coming up a lot. President himself is using that word. Maybe people start to get interested in a scheme where there's this natural increase. So that's one of the reasons you're seeing more. Hopefully I've explained why this is increasing over time. But that's one of the reasons you're seeing more of an interest in this. And I'm, I guess, in a glass half full scenario, this rising inflation uh, is is pushing people to talk to you, listen to you, read you, and say, okay, let's let's look deeper in this. I was writing down as my marketing brain was rolling on what could you call this and what could you stamp this at, and just the acronym TORI came out, which is transfer of risk income, which is that's what it is. You're transferring the risk, and you're, you're or you're sharing the risk. Um, for income, and you can add another I on top of that, which is increasing income, which I think, I think that's the part that people will listen to. Because in essence, it sounds like to me, it's a life only annuity that you're, as long as you're living, you're um, people that, that, that have followed my work, you know what a life only annuity is. I always tell people when your Learjet hits the mountain, money goes poof. Now, Moshe gave it a, a, a much better um, example of that, but it's a life only taunting shared pooled risk of which income increases for the people that um, are still breathing. And I think if it could be explained like that, I don't think people in this country would have a problem with doing a product like that, um, or at least a portion of their, what I call their income floor, which is social security, dividends, annuities, commercial, and these type of new annuities. The interesting part is going to be 
how they're distributed within the industry. And I think that's going to be the challenge. Obviously, you're, you know that. Everyone else looking at it knows that. But I think we need as an industry to, hey, forget the distribution. Let's put it out there. Let's get it out there to where it's, you know, and show people that it, that it works. And I think it would help the annuity industry as a whole because people would understand you're transferring risk for lifetime income. I always tell people, I don't know the ROI until you die. You know, up until that point, it is a, it's a transfer risk. Now, you find yourself over in Europe a lot in, in, in libraries, am I correct? I'm envisioning you over there all the time. Um, actually, you're, you're, you're catching me when I just came back uh, two days ago from the archives in Edinburgh, in nice. uh, Scotland. Uh, I, I don't want to bore your audience to death, but the Church of Scotland uh, introduced one of the first funded annuities in the early 18th century. When you take a look at annuities, it's one thing for me to guarantee you a payment for the rest of your life. But if you're smart, you're going to say to me, Moshe, how are you going to make sure that that payment is actually going to stay there for the rest mm -hmm. of my life? It's one thing for the king to promise payments, but I want the king to set aside some money to make sure that those payments are going to be made. That's called a funded annuity. So you can mm -hmm. go back to biblical times. Kings were promising annuities from biblical times, and then they defaulted on them because they'd never set aside any money for it. <laughs> the first entity, the first entity to actually set aside money and say, all right, we've just promised annuities to ministers. We better make sure we manage this money to pay those annuities and we have to have a large pool. The first entity that did that was the Church of Scotland in the early 18th century. It's the first funded annuity period. So I went and I was able to gain access to their documents and their archives to see how they designed it. It's the subject of my next book, and I don't want to give away too much, but I found it fascinating how they set that scheme up. And it was because ministers and eventually university professors said, hey, man, I want an annuity when I retire. I want an annuity for my spouse. Mm -hmm. I want an annuity for my kids. I don't want to give them money. They're going to squander it. Somebody will steal it from them. They don't know right. how to manage money. Give them an annuity. So that, that was, to me, uh, quite interesting. And I spent a couple of weeks there, and they were very kind, and they gave me access to it. So uh, the short answer is yes, I do spend a lot of time in archives and libraries. When you are, Don't give away the farm, because I want people to buy the book, because I'm going to buy it as well. But were you surprised with some of the things you found? Did you have any, oh, oh my goodness, moments hitting your forehead when you found stuff? Or was it predictable what you found in the archives. You know, to be honest, I thought I was going there to cross the T's and dot the I's because like, I know what I'm going to find. It's going to be these documents, but you know, you got to go through, you got to do it, right? You just got to make the pilgrimage. You got to touch the documents and come home. No, there was a lot of very shocking, very interesting things in terms of how they did things. Uh, some of the participants in these annuities, I found interesting the management of it. Uh, some of the concerns around fraud, some of the choices that people had. There was a parallel to some of the things that we see today in defined contribution plans. There mm -hmm. were defaults. I mean, one of the issues that they had to contend with is, you know, this is in Scotland. They are presbyteries uh, spread across the country. You know, sure. how do you, do you force people into the plan or do you just, you know, tell them if you want, you can join the annuity fund, uh, which is very similar to defaults now in 401ks and DC plans. And what they said was, well, you had a year to, to, to default, to say, I'm not interested. So they gave you a year, unless you're in the north of Scotland, then they gave you two years because, you know, it's a long time to get your notice back there. But if we didn't hear from you, we would default you into the annuity. And this is echoing some of the discussion now with Secure 2.0 about what should happen to a plan as they approach retirement. Should we default people into an annuity? And they struggled with the same thing 280 years ago. I mean, you know, we're forcing them into an annuity. It's a lifetime income product. Are they going to, are the ministers going to complain? How do we default them? So what I found interesting was a lot of the parallels with some of the things we deal with today. Uh, they, they dealt with at that time. And uh, it was, uh, you know, that was interesting to me. Some of the administrative aspects of managing this you know the actuarial theory is three percent the administration okay. is 97 percent. how do you get the lists of who's alive and who's not alive and who's contributed and at what rate did they contribute how big did their pool have to be you know there weren't enough ministers and parishes so they asked university professors to join because they got a couple of hundred more people and now they can use the law of large numbers anyway this is things that interest me i'm a professor i can afford to have that habit that is fantastic. No, I'm, I'm not a professor and, and you're sitting there and I'm like, you know, listening intently to every word because it just sounds fascinating because my, and I can't read, uh, wait to read the book because I want to hear how they dealt with these things, how they dealt with the problems that are similar in fashion to what we're going to do now. 
please tell me, Moshe, that our government, the United States government, is hiring you to help with these types of ideas. Look, I, I've helped, uh, I, you know, I have one foot in the U.S., one foot in Canada. So mm -hmm. I, I spend time teaching here, but I have a place sure. in Florida. So I've done a lot of consulting work for the state of Florida, the Florida State Board of Administration. So I spent quite a bit of time in Tallahassee many years ago. And uh, that was about them converting their defined benefit plan to defined contribution. Because, you know, at the time, the governor, Jeb Bush, you may recall, mm -hmm. uh, one of his ideas was, you know, we, we've got to give people choices and not everybody wants a DB plan, especially if they're younger. But the key was, we wanted to ensure, the designers of the fund wanted to ensure that uh, people had access to annuities at retirement. When you take away someone's defined benefit pension and mm -hmm. you say to them, no, you're, you're not going to get a guaranteed income for life, you have to give them something similar, which is an annuity. So I was there to help vet what companies and what products would be allowed into the plan, put it on the shelf, so to speak, uh, that people would be able to select as they moved into retirement. And you'll appreciate this, the uh, sponsors and certainly the politicians, they want complicated annuities in there. They didn't want the, the, the security type annuity. They wanted simple DIAs and SPIAs mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and QLACs. And the question was, you know, do you go with the highest payout? Well, that's not necessarily safe because sometimes the highest payout isn't necessarily from a credit quality that you want. Mm -hmm. uh, do you go with the highest credit quality? Well, the payout won't be high. What sort of options do you give people? So the short answer to your question is I have been involved a little bit in some localized projects, state projects, but there are many brilliant minds in the U.S. in this space, and uh, I know that many of them are helping, uh, whether it's the Treasury or the, or the Fed or certainly the IRS in terms of the tax treatment of these things. So the short answer is I am one of many researchers that are interested in these things, and yes, they are being tapped as a group to help governments, although you know sometimes there's a communication gap there. It sounds too academic, too theoretical, Politicians may not like it. Yeah, it's, it all comes down to messaging when you're talking to the consumer. The consumer is the, the listener to this podcast. And, and I think that's one of the reasons this is one of the fastest growing podcasts in the financial sector is because we're having people on like you that's making people think and they're hearing what you're doing. <clears throat> I guarantee they don't know what a ton, tontine is. By the way, it's spelled T-O-N-T-I-N-E if you're Googling it. Um, but we'll have that link on, on the site for Moshe as well. Um, so for you, you're always, it seems like you're always digging in and trying to find the next blue water, as I call it, you know, things that other people aren't thinking about. What hit me when you said, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking about what people are going to do. I wanted to see what they were doing back then. That's a contrarian thought. That's not an, an a natural thought. Maybe it is for an acad academian like you, but not for the normal person out here. What's the next mountain you're looking to climb? Is there something that's piqued your interest that has caught your eye and attention that you really want to dig into? Because you've, I know you can keep digging into tontines and, and that, but is there anything in the annuity space that you're looking at that is new? So, so look, Sam, you, you know how it is when we academic, it's like watching a star that exploded. The light that you're seeing today was generated millions of light years ago. Even the sure. light that comes from the sun came seven or eight minutes ago. So, you know, the Tontine stuff that's coming out now, I worked on that 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm bored by it. I'm not saying I'm not interested in it. But, you know, that, that's been done. You, you sure. can't sit you know, your entire life at the same well. What interests me now, once I get this uh, annuity fund out of the way, what interests me now is long-term care. Namely, that as people age, as people age, it's not just that they want predictable income for the rest of their life, which is great, or guaranteed income. They need to know what will their expenditures be and what will their health expenditures be and how do they manage, hedge, and ensure that. So I have become interested in the gap between lifespan and health span. Lifespan is how long you live. We've talked about that, longevity risk. Health span is how long do you live healthy? And the gap between health span and lifespan can be, you know, zero. You got hit by a bus, sadly. And the gap between lifespan and health span can be 20 years. You know, you get hit right. with something. You're just not in very good health anymore. And now you got to manage for the next 20 years. I think long-term care products, annuities that are linked to long-term care, long-term hedges, long -term, I think that's something that, that needs to get more uh, investigation. It needs to get more attention. Uh, money doesn't solve your problems. I, and I, I know that sounds cliche. You, you need to do something with it to solve your problems. How many times do you throw money at a problem and it didn't solve it? 
What do you mean? I fixed that bloody air conditioner last year. Why didn't it get fixed? And we got to throw it up. How do we throw money at things efficiently when it comes to healthcare? It's something that interests me because as you age, that's going to be a big deal. It's not the money. How do I get better? How do I you know, deal with arthritis? Forget about the annuity check. That's great. Thank you, Stan, for the annuity check. I need to deal with my arthritis. Can you give me some suggestions? No, that's not my bailiwick. I don't deal with it. Well, maybe you should. Maybe you should get an annuity that pays in arthritis medication. And, and I mean that just sort of half as a joke. But that's something that interests me now. How do we deal with the long-term care challenge? Boy, that's a big one. I wasn't expecting that from you, but I'm glad I asked because I now feel comfortable with you going at it and figuring it out. Obviously, the long-term care space is a different space because it's a health insurance product, not a life insurance product. A life insurance product, um, life insurance companies issue annuities for the people listening out there. And there are some annuity types that have what's called confinement care or enhanced benefit type um, guaranteed issue uh, products out there. And we certainly can show you those, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about literally solving for specific things. Now, are you thinking, and I'm, I'm, if I'm off base, tell me, are you thinking that in the future there will be annuity type products that are addressing not only income, but specific issues of health and long-term care? I do. And I, I think that, you know, when you think of activities of daily living, that trigger a long-term care policy. Sure. Why, can't I, why can't I buy a SPIA that uh, as soon as you're diagnosed with, uh, you know, let's say you can't do three of five activities of daily living. You can't bathe, you can't clothe, clothe yourself, you can't uh, walk to mm -hmm. the bathroom. Well, just, you know, the, the payment triples. Why would I want the payment to triple? Well, because now you're gonna have to hire someone to help you with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so because I, it's not so much the income that I want, it's the services that I'm going to get. I, I really need the income. Income is just part of it. I need the income to get goods and services. You've solved part of my problem, Stan. You're getting me the income for the rest of my life. I need to get services and I need to get goods. Are you helping me with that? And some people might say, that's not my problem. Uh, you know, go talk to a medical profession. Go talk to a social worker. And what I'm trying to say is, no, I think this is going to be part of the financing. Because if you give me a sum of money that doesn't quite cover the services and the goods that I need, what's, what's the point of that sum of money? Especially if it's depreciating over time. So the answer to your question is yes. I see annuities having long-term care riders, just like a lot of the life insurance policies. You can buy a life insurance policy sure. that is going to pay out $100,000 as a death benefit. But if you need long-term care, they'll multiply it by five. Let me say that again. You yep. have life insurance. If you die, the beneficiary gets 100000 But if you're still alive and you need long-term care, you can draw down like a bathtub $500,000 worth of long-term care over time. And, and I can see a lot of people saying, yeah, I want that. I want that. I need to deal with aging. I need to deal with aging. I've seen it with my parents. I need to deal with myself. So this is something that interests me. You asked me, what's, where's the puck going? No, I, right? I'm I a think, Canadian. I think it's great. Where's the puck going? Yeah. No, I, I love it. I think, the, um, I think the issue, and I'm always thinking from the consumer standpoint, how to get the policy approved and to the consumer and the benefits in place. So when I'm thinking that, I, I'm thinking, okay, underwriting issues, if, if there are any, uh, pricing issues from the carrier that's issuing the policy. But my hope is that with this type of thought, people that have diabetes or that have pre-existing pre conditions, it would be really nice if they could buy a guaranteed issue product that addressed that specific thing without having to go and get underwritten, whether it's simplified issue or full underwriting. Because as I always say, Annuity or, or, or long-term care companies, they want to, they want to ensure young, healthy people. Um, I think with 10,000 baby members hitting 65 every single day, most of us, and I'm in, I'm not that there yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell everybody my age because I look so vibrant and young, right, Moshe? Um, but, but I, I would want to buy something for pre-diabetic, which is who I am. You know, can I buy an annuity that addresses that? Boy, you talk about opportunity and a niche market, because it sounds like to me that you're thinking from the life insurance standpoint that you can buy, if you're a smoker, you can buy life insurance because you're a smoker. You know, it might cost you a little bit more, but it's never been addressed from the standpoint of health issues from an annuity standpoint. And that's what you're talking about. That is absolutely fascinating, which means my, my SPIA calculator would be SPIA calculator healthy, SPIA calculator pre-diabetic, SPIA calculator cancer, SPIA calculator, whatever. <laughs>
You know, Stan, one of the things that I've been sort of puzzled by is why people don't ask for underwritten annuities uh, more, meaning, look, I want an annuity, but I'm not in good health. Pay me more. I'm not going to cost mm -hmm. you as much. Mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, in uh, England, Scotland, there's something called impaired annuities. Sure. Where you say, look, I want an annuity. So I, I, I could certainly see that uh, if we can dig just a little bit more into the actuarial without turning off your audience. Mm -hmm. When you buy an annuity from an insurance company, they're worried you're going to live a very, very long time. That's their fear. They've got to set aside capital and reserves sure. for that. But if at the same time you add to it something that pays out in the event of a long-term care need, then there's an internal hedge in there because the actuaries are saying, look, both aren't going to happen. This person isn't moving into a nursing home tomorrow and living 40 years. So they can suddenly be a little bit better in pricing. What I mean is usually you buy a toaster and you buy a fax machine you know, using the historical analogy, you never think of combining a toaster and a fax machine. Like what? <laughs> yeah. But what if I told you get a really, really cheap because the underlying mechanism for the toaster and the fax machine are exactly the same. We can combine it, we can make it cheaper. I think when it comes to long-term care, you might be able to get a better SPIA payout, a better pay. Your calculator will show a higher payout if not necessarily they come in and they say, I've got pre-diabetes. I say, I also want to buy a long-term care rider attached to it. It'll be cheaper than combining them together. I, I, I do think that if you're in the annuity industry, you have to have some conversations around this. You have to be aware of it. It's Absolutely. going on in the background. You need to understand it's not the money that people want. It's the stuff they're going to do with it. I think right. that's the key message here. And I think the future of the annuity industry is solving is right now the annuity industry says we can solve the income stream. Here's the income stream. Then go solve whatever you got to solve. And I think the future is like you're saying. Here's the annuity income stream that will also solve and and target what you're worried about instead of just throwing it at you and say go get it. I think that's um, that's fascinating. Now to answer your question about why don't people do. Um, underwritten spias, there's just not many, I mean, it's not competitive. And the great part about the annuity industry, in my opinion, for most products, spias, DS, QLAX, MIGOS, index annuities, whatever, these are commodity products. There's, there's, there's bunches of them and you shop them for the highest contractual guarantee. I always tell people to do that. You own annuity for what it will do, not what it might do. But if you're doing an underwritten spia and for the consumer out there, what you're saying to the annuity company is you're proving to them that your life expectancy is actually less which means that the payments will be fewer, which means that the payments will be higher. That's what that means. That's what Moshe is talking about. The problem now is there's maybe one or two, maybe three tops companies that are doing underwritten immediate annuities at this time in the United States. That is a problem, big time. So I would love that, but I, for whatever reason, companies have shied away from that. Yeah. So Stan, you know, it's a chicken and egg issue. Yep. You know, what comes first? I mean, nobody's interested in it. So companies don't find the need to maintain an active line, marketing, keeping your registrations, you know, mm -hmm. satisfying. Them. It's not worth it. Uh, but then if the demand comes there, then the, the, the companies see an opportunity. So, you know, the question is, what's going to happen first? Is somebody going to get up and say, we're starting to offer impaired annuities mm -hmm. and just let's give it a try? Or will advisors, uh, people such as yourself, influencers, you know, with a very mm -hmm. wide audience and readership say, hey, you know, it's time to bring these things in. We might increase the size of the annuity message from people who say, look, I'm not in great health. I would like to get one of them. Well, and what we have to do when we, we go through that process is someone says, I want to underwrite a SPIA to see if I can get a better payout because I'm going to prove that my life expectancy is less. We warn them up front that there is a good possibility you're going to be denied. And that's a problem as well. I, I think if there would be a simplified issue type underwritten SPIA, consumer friendly, I think people would flock to it just because a lot of people have underlying conditions and would like to get you know, in essence, an accelerated payment. But I, I yeah. think it's fascinating where you're headed with this. I encourage you to, to dig into the long-term care side because, as you know, the long-term, traditional long-term care, there's not many carriers left in the United States for a myriad of reasons. Yeah. And there's three different types of long-term care, which, you know, I have a long-term care expert on and we go through those things. His name is Jack Lindenberg. He's fantastic if you want me to point you to him. Um, but I think that's, that's interesting for where you're headed. What's the difference between Canadian and U.S. type annuities? You know, I get, the, I get a lot of calls from, from people that watch my videos and, and podcasts. I'm sure that you're, you being on will give those Canadian calls in. 
Um, yeah. So what do you it's, see it's, up there? Yeah. So it's it's very interesting that you you ask that. So I am a Canadian and U.S. citizen, right? Uh, which means that I file taxes in both countries. Lucky me. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't even want to start talking about what a patriot, huh? <laughs> yeah. What it, it's get? Well, there's some tax credits that you I get know. for one, not a hundred percent tax credits. I, I I could do a whole podcast on on tax regimes. In fact, my PhD thesis was on the reconciliation of the Canadian and U.S. tax system. But to answer your question, okay. there are many annuity products that are available in the U.S. that are simply unavailable in Canada. Correct. So when I purchase, I own three annuities. I mean, we can get into which ones, but I, mm -hmm. I bought them all as an American citizen with a residence in Florida because you simply can't get them here. They don't exist. They're not offered. And why the innovation hasn't hit here may be part of the fact that there's more defined benefit pensions here per capita than there is in the U.S. But for all of you that are listening to this, all three of you that happen to be Canadian and U.S. citizens who happen to have a Canadian residency and a U.S. residency, all one, all one of you, if you're buying one of these things, get it from Stan in the U.S., even Thank if you. there's a Stan in Canada. That's right. That's that. Well, obviously, we, we, we appreciate that. Um, and we do like working with people all across the United States. And if there was a chance for us to do Canadian, we would because we do get a lot of those calls. Um, if you were annuity czar, and you were sitting over top of everything, what would you change? I know it's loaded and broad, but pick something. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, there isn't such a position. You know, insurance is regulated by the state. So there are 52 or 51. Let, let me dream. I'm dreaming. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Um, I, I think that uh, if I could throw, you know, a couple of hundred million dollars at the problem, which is what czars are allowed to do these days, they can go to Congress, they put sure. in a footnote, and before you know it, a hundred million dollars have come into their budget. Uh, a, a, you know, a public advertising campaign to clarify what these things are and how important they are to reduce the financial illiteracy around these products. Don't have it run by companies or affiliated organizations that where you say, eh, they got a bias, they're not. And I'm, I'm the last one to say, let's hand it over to government. But you've just given me a government job. I did. I got to figure out what to do, right? I'm not saying let's hand it over. If you handed me a government job, I would suck out that budget and say, let's get this thing clarified. Here are the different types. Here's what they do. These are the different vitamins, A, B, C, D, and N. Here's what the vitamins do. And we put it on the package. And, and there's clarity around the nutritional content of these things. I go to the store. I pick up my vitamins. I know, am I getting zinc in there? There's no zinc. My doctor said I needed zinc. Let's pick up the multivitamins. That sort of clarity of message Love and it. clarity of ingredients and, and clarity of what are these things is what I would do. Uh, um, let's, let's get a messaging campaign out there. Uh, instead of putting more roadblocks or barriers or legislative uh, roadblocks in front of the, the or, or mandating anything for that matter. And I would do the exact same thing. It would all be about messaging. It would all be simplified. It would all be repetitive and easy to understand. It would stick in the back of your head and you'd understand when the word annuity was used, whether it was got guarantees or transfer of risk or whatever we came up with. I think that's the biggest problem with an industry that has a monopoly an absolute monopoly on lifetime income. How that, how this isn't a multi-trillion dollar market annually, I don't understand. And sometimes it feels like I'm screaming into a hurricane with people that don't under, that the industry that doesn't seem to care because they're making so much money. Last question, Moshe, and I appreciate once again, Moshe Malewski, we're gonna have his stuff on the site, but uh, boy, has it been a pleasure and I could talk to you forever. And hopefully one of these days we are, our paths will cross especially in Florida. I live in Florida and Las Vegas, so maybe we'll, our Florida paths will cross. But this is the last question, and I do it with all of my celebrity guests. I don't give them a heads up on it, but it's called the mic drop moment. And what I want you to do is I'm going to hand you the mic, and you're going to say something that you think the consumers out there that are listening to this need to hear and walk away with because you're Moshe Molesky. So mic drop moment, Moshe Molesky. Yeah, I, I think that uh, consumers should pay more attention to what fees, commissions, and uh, you know revenue sharing agreements 
uh, exist with all the financial products that they buy. I think many of them are embarrassed to ask this. They have a good relationship with their financial advisor, their local mm-hmm. insurance agent, their local car insurance salesperson. And I think that people have to become more accustomed to look, what, what's the markup on this thing? You know, I'm yep. buying a car. This is what I'm paying. You know, you can easily spreadsheet and compare. I think that would also solve part of the problem. The skeptic and the consumer says, yeah, you're making a big, you know, you're ripping me off. Well, mm-hmm. if you disclose that it wasn't that much, you know, maybe I'd feel more comfortable with it. It's not just, I don't understand it. Even if I do understand it, I'm concerned that it's very opaque and I don't understand how much I'm making. So ask awkward questions. That's the mic drop moment. Learn to ask awkward questions to people you like. Yeah, I know I have a great relationship with my advisor, but here's an awkward question. Exactly how much money are you making from this? I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I, that might be a t-shirt, Moshe, that we have us ask awkward questions <laughs> to get the right answers. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you joining me. And thank you so much for everyone yeah. out there that's, yeah. that's joined us on all the podcast platforms, the YouTube channel called Fun with Annuities. And I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site, at theannuityman.com, where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get. And that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of. So join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet, Fun with Annuities.